for the reading of God's word. Out of thankfulness to God for giving us his word, at the end of the reading, I will conclude by saying, this is the word of the Lord, and we invite you all to respond together. Thanks be to God. Our reading tonight is John 19, 16, verse, verse 16 through 37. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and he went out, bearing his own cross, to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke their legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true and he knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thanks, Carly. You guys can grab a seat. Uh, good evening. Thanks for being here tonight. Uh, if I haven't had a chance to meet you, my name is Ian. I have the privilege of being one of the pastors here at the King's Church, and it's always a, a special occasion when we can uh, gather all together, kids included. So kids, glad you guys are in here this evening and uh, see a lot of new faces. Uh, for those of you who are new, uh, welcome to uh, the King's Church. Uh, tonight, we are uh, turning our attention and centering ourselves on the cross of Jesus Christ. And this uh, action is not easy work. See, to look at the cross and behold all that is going on in that moment is to be confronted with darkness and evil in the fullest sense. But it is only through the death of Jesus that you and I, if you're a believer in Christ, have salvation here this evening. The cross comes before the crown of the resurrection that we celebrate on Easter Sunday in just a few days. But I think it is important that we don't skip ahead to the empty tomb before we pause to consider the cross. You see, we need both the cross and the empty tomb together to make sense of all that happened a few thousand years ago outside the gates of Jerusalem. I think it's noteworthy that when Jesus talks about following him, when he describes step one of the discipleship journey, he actually talks about crucifixion. In Luke 9, for example, he said to all the people who were around him, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, in the church, we use this language of cross-bearing uh, often. 
Uh, whenever we run across an inconvenience or a circumstance or a hardship or something that's less than ideal, we can turn and we can say to one another, well, you know, that's just my cross to bear. That's a very churchy phrase, right? If you've grown up in church, we throw that around quite a bit. But I want to challenge us this evening, do we really know what that means? Do we really grasp all that Jesus is saying when he says, if anyone wants to follow me, he must take up his cross? You see, if we're not careful, I think the familiarity with both the image of the cross and the language about the cross can cause us to miss both the shock and the weight of what Jesus is asking here. Anytime we talk about the cross, there simultaneously ought to be a gravity and a glory that fills our thinking. So tonight, briefly in our time together, uh, we're going to look at this passage that Carly just read for us out of the Gospel of John. And I want us to look at five aspects of the crucifixion of Christ from this passage. And kids, if you're following along on the clipboard, we've got those kind of outlined at the bottom of that page. So follow along with us. Here's the first thing I want us to observe, that the cross shows us a forsaken king. Look back in the text with me at verse 16. It says, So they took Jesus. He went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him with two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. But the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. That's Pilate's version of it is what it is. So what's going on here? Well, John presents the details in a very straightforward way. Jesus makes the walk to the place of the skull, Golgotha. Uh, we often call this Calvary in a lot of worship songs today, which is the Latin. The Romans made those who were being crucified carry their own cross through the streets, almost like a parade. It was to draw the scorn and the ire of onlookers. Then they picked strategic locations in a public, invisible spot so that all could see what was going on and those being condemned to crucifixion could be made an example of. The other gospel writers tell us that Jesus eventually becomes too weak and that Simon of Cyrene has to assist him. But the gospel of John emphasizes that this is Jesus' cross alone to bear. And it was customary in crucifixions for the charge or the crime of the person being crucified to be displayed above them on that cross. This is the case with Jesus. It says, Jesus of Nazareth the king of the Jews. John tells us that Pontius Pilate, the Roman official overseeing this crucifixion, he sanctioned that inscription. Now this is fitting since Jesus and Pilate kind of went back and forth quite a bit about this idea of kings and kingdoms in the preceding context. At one point, Pilate actually places Jesus on a throne of sorts, an elevated judgment seat, and he mockingly says to the Jewish people gathered there to watch the spectacle, Behold your king. But the Jewish leaders want nothing to do with this claim. You see, they know to agree with that claim could mean they could end up crucified as well. And they were not ready to bear that cross. Now this entire scene is dripping in a haunting divine irony, isn't it? I mean, Jesus is indeed a king, and he is king in the highest sense possible of the word king. And Jesus himself knew to expect this jeering and this mocking in this very moment. You see, throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus talks about his own crucifixion as his glorification. As in, on the cross, it is the very place where he is coronated and crowned as king for all to see. This is quite the upside-down kingdom that Jesus is bringing to earth. But Pilate's stubbornness to make an example of Jesus actually serves to communicate the truth, doesn't it? Jesus' kingship is announced in three different languages. In the Aramaic, the language of the people in this area. In Latin, the language of the empire. And in Greek, the common language of the people. 
all could read Jesus of Nazareth, king. And being in three languages was symbolic that he's not just the king of the Jews, he is the king of the whole world. The cosmic creator king is being coronated through the cross. F.F. F. Bruce says it this way, the crucified one is the true king, the kingliest king of all, because it is he who is stretched on the cross. He turns an obscene instrument of torture into a throne of glory and reigns from the tree. Jesus is a forsaken king, but nonetheless the true king. Secondly, the cross shows us a forceful shame. Look at verse 23. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments, they divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, and also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but let's cast lots for it and see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. The process of crucifixion was not simply designed to execute enemies of the state, though that was the end outcome. The whole processional around the cross was meant to shame the one being crucified. See, crucifixion in the first century was the ultimate denial of your humanity and your dignity. It was meant to dehumanize and degrade the person being nailed to that cross. But I think it's of note that none of the four gospel accounts that we have put emphasis on the physical pain of the crucifixion. Have you ever noticed that? Which, by the way, the physical pain would have been unthinkable, horrendous. But they don't focus there. Instead, they all, including John, draw their attention to the shame, to the disgrace, and to the God-forsakenness of it all. And the casting of lots and the bidding for Jesus' clothing fits right into that picture, doesn't it? This was a normal part of the benefits of the job for these Roman executioners. They were carrying on with business as normal. But if we zoom out for a minute and think about it, we realize that this forceful shame upon Jesus shows us that in his crucifixion, he is dying a curse-bearing death. Let me show you that in the text. Think about what's happening in this scene. He is stripped naked. Nakedness in the scriptures represents shame and disgrace, and we know that from as old as the Garden of Eden, don't we? Adam and Eve sin, and all of a sudden, what do they realize? They're naked. Well, what's happened? Why is that their first instinct? Shame has rushed into the perfect world that has now been lost. They try to cover themselves up with fig leaves, and Jesus is naked on the cross. He is bearing the shame of the curse of sin. But that's not all. Earlier in the John's Passion account, we are told that Jesus is fitted with that famous crown of thorns. Now, of all the things the Roman soldiers could have picked to mock Jesus, they pick an item that is mentioned in Genesis 3. In Genesis 3, the sign of the curse to the ground itself because of the sin in Adam and Eve was that thorns and thistles would come forth. And Jesus is crowned with a sign of that very curse. And then Jewish law itself in Deuteronomy 21 says plainly, anyone who is hanged on a tree is cursed by God. And the Jews did not draw a distinction between a tree and a tree. And across, you see, Jesus is dying a curse-bearing death, even though he is the sinless, righteous one. But in all of this, John lets us in on something. There's more going on here than meets the eye. He tells us that the soldiers casting lots for his clothing is actually a fulfillment of Scripture. And he quotes Psalm 22, verse 18. If you have a Bible, why don't you put your finger back in Psalm 22? It is impossible to appreciate all that is going on at the cross without a working knowledge of Psalm 22. That particular psalm is a psalm of King David. And if you read it, it describes in vivid detail a crucifixion. But here's the thing. This psalm was written hundreds of years before crucifixion was even around. David talks about his hands and his feet being pierced. 
there's this interesting, mysterious interplay between the song of David and the events of Jesus Christ. What has happened is that the Holy Spirit, the author of Scripture, alongside its human authors, has forced his way into this psalm. He is speaking through David of something of his own circumstance, but ultimately something that even exceeds that. And it reveals what's going on in this moment at the cross. You might remember in Matthew and Mark's gospel, they record Jesus' cry of, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is verse 1 of Psalm 22. It is the king crying out to God in a place of abandonment. There is no greater cry from Jesus on the cross than Psalm 22. But here's the thing. When Jesus quotes that, he's not just thinking of verse 1. He has the entire psalm in mind. Back then, there were no chapter numbers and verses. That's a great privilege we have today. When they would recall the psalms, they would begin by saying the first line. And Jesus begins with the first line, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the rest of the psalm is meant to color our understanding of the cross. This will make more sense as we go. You see, the cross shows a forsaken king, but it also shows a forceful shame. Thirdly, it shows a family crisis. Look at verse 25. It says, But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. It's really hard to keep all the Marys straight, by the way. So hopefully you followed along. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. There's so much going on here. Let's start with Mary. Think about Mary, the mother of Jesus. It is hard to fathom what she is experiencing in this moment as she watches her son be crucified. It would have created an unthinkable pain and heartbreak. But Mary's presence and John drawing attention to that is not a coincidence. She is there on purpose and her presence is significant. First of all, it is a fulfillment of scripture. Simeon, who was at the temple in Jerusalem when Jesus was brought as a young child to be consecrated to the Lord, he said this to Mary. He said, behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. And then he says this, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also. Now Mary could not have fathomed all that that meant, but here in this moment, the sword is indeed piercing her own soul. Mary also could not know the even bigger story that in that moment, the ancient message of the gospel preached to the serpent in Genesis 3.15 was also coming true. Jesus doesn't call her mother, he calls her woman. What does Genesis 3.15 say? That an offspring of the woman will come. And though the serpent will bruise his heel, he will crush the head of the enemy. But there's a mutual affliction. And Mary is witnessing the bruising of the heel and the crushing of the head all at once. But here's the thing. Her presence also fits into that song that is on the thoughts and the lips of Jesus. Mary is there as a steadfast reminder of the love of God to her son in the midst of the horror of the scene. In Psalm 22, look at verse 9. The psalmist there cries out, Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you I was cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Jesus is hanging on the cross. He looks out and sees of all the people there, his mother. All the disciples have left except for John. If there is ever a moment to doubt God's faithfulness to him, it's right here. But he is singing Psalm 22. He looks out as he recites God's word and he sees his mom. Russell Moore says this, even as, the, even as Jesus' disciples fled from him in shame, he could cite Psalm 22 while looking out from the cross at his mother. In the moment of his greatest desolation, Jesus could see the invisible outline of God's mercy and presence there. 
in the one whom in his human nature he learned to trust a father, fathering, nurturing God. He learned that from his mother, and there she stood. But it's not just Mary who's there. It's also John, the beloved disciple, or the disciple whom Jesus loved in this gospel. Now, his presence at the cross is a bit of a mystery. After all, all of the other disciples have vanished. They have run away. But here remains John. And you want to know the craziest part? John doesn't even believe yet. Chapter 20 is going to tell us that. He doesn't even know what is going on. Why is John there? Well, John appears to be there because he loves Jesus. He has just given up three years of his life to follow him. And church tradition says he is quite a young man. In fact, he might be so young the Romans don't view him as a threat, and that's why he's there. These are the prime years of his life. But here he stands looking at his rabbi, his master, his Lord being crucified. And he has nothing to say about it. It looks like it's all over, and he is there to witness its bloody end. But, like Mary... John's presence is not a coincidence. His presence is meaningful. His presence, I think, is meant to be an encouragement to Jesus himself. Psalm 22, as it goes on, says, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Psalm 22 invokes images of Jesus' mother and of his brothers. His brothers, plural, might not be there, but his brother John is there. So Jesus looks out at Mary, and he sees John, and what he does in this moment is so profound. He looks at the two of them. They are standing in the shadow of the cross, and he gives them to one another. He says, behold your son, behold your mother. And friends, I don't want you to miss, this is the beginning of the church. This is the beginning of the church. He looks at Mary and again does not call her his mother, he calls her woman. She is a follower and a disciple first and foremost and, she, and he ensures that she has a new family. And this new family is not formed by the blood of biology but by the blood of the cross. Jesus arranges this adoption in a way where its source and its shape is a crucifixion. Everything about the crucifixion was meant to isolate and divide and scatter. But as Jesus hangs there alone, he looks out and he joins a new family together. John and Mary now have one another, and this is the church. No matter what happens in the world, you might find yourself standing alone at the foot of the cross, and the reality is you are not alone. Jesus has brought you into his new family with brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, united by the blood of the cross. Fourth, we see that the cross is a finished work. Look at verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to its mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Now the offer here of this wine was not meant to be a sedative, it actually was meant to prolong his life and hence prolong the agony of the cross. But it's striking that John never presents Jesus as a helpless victim, does he? Yes, Jesus might be hanging on a cross, and he might look powerless to all who are observing this horrific scene, but Jesus knows a greater story is being written. This is the mysterious and sovereign plan of the triune God, out of love from eternity past to accomplish redemption for an unworthy people. There are plenty of others who may unwittingly contribute to the fulfillment of God's plan, but Jesus knows exactly what is going on. He is not passive. This is the plan of God. 
And he knows his physical thirst, it fits into the larger story. Remember, his mind is seeped in scripture. He has Psalm 22 on his heart. The psalmist there talks about his tongue sticking to the roof of his mouth. Another psalm explicitly says in in Psalm 69, they gave me poison for food, and for my thirst they gave me sour wine to drink. Jesus says, I thirst, and he says it because he knows scripture is being fulfilled. The onlookers hear of this thirst, and they hold up a sponge soaked in cheap wine, but they hold it up, of of all things they could hold it up with, with a hyssop branch. This is the same instrument that was used to spread the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of the homes in the Passover story back in Exodus. The message of Passover was this, a lamb was to be substituted in place of the death of a firstborn. All of those who were safe under the blood of the lamb were saved from death and its consequences. The lamb was a substitution and a sacrifice on their behalf. The hyssop branch applied that redemption to their doors, and here that hyssop branch shows up at the cross. Then after receiving this drink, it says that Jesus said, It is finished. Now, this cry is not a cry of defeat. This is also not a cry of relief related to the pain. It's not even a statement about his impending death. The Greek here, which is just one word, it means the completion of a task. It meant mission accomplished. It was the fulfillment of a requirement carried out to its very end. In fact, in this time period, people would write this one word on a bill after it had been paid in full. To telestai would be stamped on it. And friends, don't miss that his work is finished precisely as he dies on a cross. The cross is not an accident. Jesus is there on purpose. And in the beginning of John's gospel, John the Baptist sees Jesus and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus here on the cross dies a substitutionary, sacrificial death as the Lamb of God. And he sees it through to the end. He did so from a posture of love. In fact, John 13 says that those whom he loved, he loved to the very end. Same word. It is finished. Brothers and sisters, our sin has been atoned for. God's promises have been fulfilled. Our guilt and our shame have been removed. The ancient serpent's head has been crushed decisively. Hope is restored, forgiveness is secured, new life is offered to us. Jesus says, it is finished. Past tense. And then Jesus gives up his own spirit. It is not taken from him. He, in victory, says it is finished. And then his spirit gives up. The last thing we see is that the cross shows us a fulfilled promise. Look at verse 31. Since it was the day of preparation and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken so they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true. He knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom... They have pierced. Jewish law said that anyone hanged on a tree should be buried the same day. And with the Sabbath approaching, the Jews asked Pilate to end this so they might be buried by sundown. 
And the way they ended it was by breaking the legs of those crucified. But when the soldiers arrive, they do that to the first and the second, those surrounding Jesus. But Jesus has already died. But to ensure that he was dead, there's the piercing of his side. And out of Jesus' side comes blood and water. Now, a lot of ink has been spilled about this. A lot of theories have been made. But here's why John brings this up. At the time of his writing, there were already people spreading false stories about Jesus, that he wasn't really a man, or he didn't really die on the cross. He only appeared to be dead. And John goes out of his way to say, I was there, I bore witness to it. Jesus died on the cross. And then he ends with two more fulfillments that remind us of the faithfulness of God. He ends with a prophecy from Zechariah talking about looking upon the one whom they have pierced and receiving salvation. But then he makes this comment about the bones of Jesus. That can feel like a strange addition here, can't it? But John notes that not one of Jesus' bones was broken. This has echoes of the Passover once more. The instructions were clear in the Passover that they were to select a lamb without blemish, and they were not to break any of its bones. And then there's a more direct quote from a righteous sufferer in Psalm 34, another Psalm of David that says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Now, there was no one stopping these soldiers from breaking Jesus' legs. They easily could have done just that, but they don't. And John, full of the Holy Spirit, sees the faithfulness of God in this. Even in this horrible act of crucifixion, God was still there. He was not absent from the scene. He was taking all of this evil and turning it for good. Once more, Russell Moore says this, the lack of broken bones there at the cross was a sign to Jesus that whatever happened could not go any further than God's purposes and that God's purposes were good. God might seem absent at the cross, but he was not. He was there providentially ruling, even though, even through the most wicked actions imaginable. Jesus could count all of his bones because of the mystery of God's providence, which works behind and through and even in the most awful things that happen to us. Jesus' intact skeleton was a sign that no matter how much it seemed that he had been abandoned, the steadfast love of God would not depart. God was still there. Let's end where we began. Jesus says, if any would follow him, that they must take up their cross daily. And brothers and sisters, if you are here tonight and you have responded to the finished work of Christ, if you are clinging to him as your only hope, if you are putting your faith in him, repenting of your sins, forsaking all else, I have good news for you this evening. You have already been crucified with Christ. Paul boldly proclaims that in Galatians 2. Your, Christ's death was your death. When we are saved, the New Testament describes it as being in Christ, which means as Christ died on that cross, you died there with him. And his resurrection that we will celebrate on Sunday is your resurrection too. This instrument of death and torture has become our source of life and hope. Jesus is a crucified king. He is stripped naked so we might be clothed in his righteousness. He has given us to one another in the new family of the church. He has finished it all so we might find rest for our souls. And in all of this, God is faithful. Mission accomplished. And he is inviting messed up, broken don't have it all together, sinners and sufferers like you and me, into that story. Have you looked at the cross, that horrible instrument of death? Have you beheld the Christ there? And have you seen that as your only hope? Tonight, the invitation is that, to pick up your cross 
and follow Jesus who has taken that cross before us and invites us into life and light. Psalm 22 ends like this. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. He has done it. That's good news this evening for that Good Friday. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you that you, uh, for the joy that was set before you, endured the shame of the cross, saw it all the way through to the end, and proclaimed the good news that it is indeed finished. I pray tonight for us here in this room who often are stuck in sin, who travail difficult circumstances in this fallen world, who feel the effects of the curse, that we would find our hope in ourselves at the foot of the cross. For those who uh, know you, Jesus, may you encourage them this evening that uh, they have been united with you in a death like this, and the hope of the resurrection lies ahead of us. For those who have not put their faith in you, I pray that the kindness of the cross, that you've done this out of love for us, would draw them to faith and repentance, and that they would find themselves there, that they would take up their cross and follow you. Lord, I pray that you would sustain our faith in this, that you would help our lives and our church and our community to have a cruciform shape to it. And may we remember the hope that you have offered to us some 2,000 years ago, outside the gates of Jerusalem, when you have finished all that was required. Help us find our rest there, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.